Are you ready to talk about the winds? We're moving forward in our set of lectures that are just very basic overview of the physical properties of the atmosphere and the kinds of processes that will have uh, influence on both electrical load and yield. Wind is an easy sell to you guys, right? I mean, obviously wind very directly influences the amount of power that can be produced at, say, a wind farm by wind turbines or whatever. And clearly, uh, wind very directly affects the amount of electrical load that's going to be uh, needed for, um, you know, homes, for example, based on the amount of heat loss and so on in structures. Wind then, is it, it's easy. I, I know that you guys need to know about wind in terms of uh, understanding electrical load and yield. Well, we, at the surface anyway, we measure winds using an instrument called an anemometer. The wind speed is, is determined by the anemometer. This is that little propeller um, cup thing that spins. Uh, it measures the wind speed. Wind direction is measured with a very simple instrument at the surface called a wind vane. I keep predicating this with, by saying at the surface, aloft it's a more complicated business to measure the wind speed and direction. Uh, when we launch weather balloons, we track them, and then either by using geometry to see based on their location or by using GPS at known locations along the way. However, we track the balloon in some sense, and therefore from that information we get the wind speed. Um, Wind is just a consequence of all the forces that are acting on the air at any given time. This is just a way of saying Newton's second law, F equals ma, where when we say F equals ma, remember we're talking force equals mass times acceleration. So the forces are telling us how a mass of an object gets accelerated. There can be a net force acting on the object that accelerates. Accelerate, remember, doesn't necessarily mean gets faster, it just means changes its velocity, whether that's its direction or its speed. So if wind is a consequence of F equals ma, we better know what those forces on the left-hand side of the equation are. As it happens, there's four main forces that affect the atmosphere uh, air parcels, and one of them we've talked about in some detail already, that's the pressure gradient force. The pressure gradient force, mathematically, is just the change in pressure between two locations. So it's like the change in pressure divided by the distance between them. As it happens, this is the only force that can actually start to put winds in motion, and it always is acting to push the air from high pressure towards low pressure. Doesn't necessarily mean the air is going to move from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure, because there's other forces that might be canceling out or in some other way changing the a net acceleration on, on the air, but the pressure gradient force's contribution is always to push the air to, from high pressure towards low pressure. So like if I have a cyclone in an anticyclone area, high pressure in an area, low pressure on this little map right here, the pressure gradient force then is always pushing from areas of high pressure towards areas of low pressure, and the more those little contour lines there are, that says how, shows how fast we're changing pressure. So the closer those lines get together, the stronger that pressure gradient force is. Whereas if those lines, those contour lines are farther apart, then the pressure gradient force is weaker and we are accelerating the air uh, less due to the pressure gradient force. In general, we like to tell atmospheric science majors that the pressure gradient force is the force that controls the speed of the wind, but that's only strictly speaking true if friction is not a factor. If friction is a factor, then that plays in too. Friction is always acting just to slow the wind down. Okay, just like friction slows any to rub two objects together, friction will always be acting to slow them down. Now, air, a layer of air sliding past another layer of air doesn't have a lot of friction. Air doesn't have very much friction with itself. When we're talking about friction in the atmosphere, we're talking about the friction where the winds are interacting with the surface of the earth. Air flowing through trees, throwing through power lines, buildings, over waves in the ocean, over high uh, mountains, and so on. It's really only over near the surface of the earth that we need to worry about the fact of uh, about the effect of friction, and friction will always be acting to slow the winds down. Another important force that is always acting in the atmosphere is the Coriolis force. Now, I've taught ATS 113 a zillion times over the years, and let me tell you. I know the Coriolis force is a very difficult topic for even atmospheric science majors who are very invested in this to understand. Non-atmospheric science majors typically are like, oh my goodness, I don't know. Let me just give you kind of the brief outline of the pressure of the Coriolis force. The Coriolis force is a force that is created by the fact that the Earth is round and it's rotating. As it's actually a consequence of the of the conservation of angular momentum and it creates a, a force that deflects motion. 
if I shoot a gun off in that direction right there, the bullet actually deflects slightly to the right, because I'm recording this in the northern hemisphere. If I were in the southern hemisphere, the, def the bullet would actually deflect slightly to the left. Now, you wouldn't really very well be able to see that deflection, because the bullet's only in the air for a second. Okay? But the winds, which are in motion for very long periods of time, those little slight deflections really add up. They are deflecting to the, the Coriolis force deflects motions to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere. Um, another force that's important in the atmosphere is the centrifugal force. The centrifugal force is that force that, like, you know, when you're on the merry-go-round, it's pushing you off the merry-go-round, it is deflecting you out from a center of rotation. Uh, this will affect any kind of winds that are rotating in the atmosphere, and as it happens, there's lots of rotational motion in the atmosphere. Hurricanes, tornadoes, mid-latitude cyclones, dust devils, lots of features in the atmosphere have spin, and therefore the centrifugal force can be a factor. So anytime you're trying to figure out how the winds are going to change, what you actually have to do is do the math to figure out what all the forces acting on the air are at the present time, and then say, okay, the net force is that how those forces add up. They may even completely cancel out. Maybe there's no net force on the air right now. That doesn't mean the air's not going to move. It means it's not going to accelerate. How object in motion stays in motion. It's just going to continue moving the way it was before. Or there might be some net force pushing the air in a new direction, accelerating the air via F equals MA. Okay? This net force will be working to accelerate the air, uh, changing its speed or changing its direction. And the result is wind. Wind is the net result of the acceleration of air parcels. And broadly speaking, there's two main ways to think about what the winds are going to be that are as a result of this uh, acceleration. One, let's think about what it means for patterns of weather aloft. The reason why I like to think first about winds aloft is it simplifies things a little bit. If we're more than a couple hundred meters above the ground, we don't have to worry about friction. So that's one less force we need to worry about. Um, and there will be a result to all the forces at work. Now, I have a little weather map right here, and if I kind of zoom it in a little bit, um, I know that you may have difficulty on YouTube or on this PowerPoint seeing that, in fact, there are there's an area of high pressure kind of over like Baja, California, and there's an area of lower pressure over like Minnesota and southern Canada. And so I just labeled them on there, and there's all these isobars, these contours separating the area of high pressure down in the southwest United States and Baja, California from that low pressure system over Minnesota. And, like, these contour lines here, I would just highlighted one in red, are what you're looking for here. And you want to see how the winds are with respect to that. Now, I circled three symbols there where we've taken observations of the wind, recognizing that you might not yet know what those winds mean, symbols mean. But those winds are, those little wind barbs, to use the right word there, point us in the direction of the wind. The little tails are at the back end. And then, like, the pointy front end of the, of the vector tells us which way the winds are going. So, like, the one that's in southeast Kansas, right in southwest Missouri here, that wind is coming from, like, the southwest. Or that wind in Florida that I have circled, that wind is from the southwest. Or that wind in Wyoming that I have circled, that wind is from the north. Okay? So we have three little wind symbols there. there and you can see what is the interesting thing about these wind symbols. They're blowing parallel to those isobars, those lines of pressure. The winds aloft will do this. They're going to blow parallel to the isobars, and there's a trick to how the speed that they're going. Their speed is going to be dependent on how close together the isobars are. So, like, look at that weather station in, like, southeast Kansas. Those the isobars are very close together, and the wind is very strong. You can tell the wind is strong uh, by those little tally marks. Technically, the right word is flags and pennants that are on the wind barb symbol right there. Uh, a pennant is 50 uh, meters per second, whatever. The, the more, I don't want to worry about, I don't want to bog you down with the numbers, but the more of those things there are on there, the faster the wind is. So like that wind over southeast Kansas and southwest Missouri is a very strong wind, and the isobars are very close together. In contrast, take a look at that uh, wind over Florida where the isobars are relatively far apart, and you see that the wind speed is much, much slower. We have um, fewer of those little symbols and fewer of them are, are filled in we have a much weaker wind speed there. Well, another scenario in which you might have to think about how forces are acting on the wind would be to talk about winds near the surface of the Earth, where friction is important. So, like, here I have a weather map that I've provided you for a particular day where there's some areas of low pressure around the map. And if I zoom it in here a little bit, there's this big cyclone, this big area of low pressure centered over, like, western Kansas on that particular day. 
and you can see how it's an area of low pressure and there's these isobars, these contours of pressure going around it and there's some wind symbols and so on and if I circle a few of them you'll see that they kind of follow the same sort of rules as the winds aloft do. Remember the winds aloft should be parallel to those isobars, to those lines of pressure and they kind of are. I mean in each of these cases here we can see like all three of those stations the winds are more or less from the south um, the one in Kansas City is a little bit more like southeast, the one in Little Rock, Arkansas is almost straight out of the south, the one in uh, central Oklahoma there is a little bit more from the southwest and so on, but they're all kind of parallel to those isobars. They're not going towards the cyclone, they're not going away from the cyclone, they're kind of going around the cyclone, but they do slightly cross the isobars. They actually cross the isobars at a small angle from the area of high pressure to the area of low pressure. It's complicated as to why the forces work out that way. Take ATS-113 and you'll learn all about it. But for now, it's enough to know that because of the addition of friction at the surface, the winds don't just go parallel to isobars. They actually kind of go uh, parallel to isobars, but they do cut across a little bit at the surface from high pressure to low pressure. And that's actually really important because think about it, the, air, the way the flow is going to go around an area of high pressure or an area of low pressure now. For an area of low pressure, which we call a cyclone, or better yet, a mid-latitude cyclone in meteorology, this is not a tornado or something like that, this is a big weather pattern covering a big chunk of the country, this big area of low pressure at the surface, well, if we weren't worried about friction, the winds would just be parallel to the isobars. And parallel to the isobars, when the isobars are just round circles around that area of low pressure, means that the winds would just kind of go in a big circle around the area of low pressure. In fact, they would rotate around the area of low pressure in a counterclockwise manner. That's what we call a cyclone. Now, at the surface, on the other hand, these winds go, uh, they go counterclockwise around a cyclone. You can work through the math and see that around, uh, that they're also going to be rather converging towards the center of the cyclone. If they're going to be crossing, the, if the winds are going to be crossing those isobars that are just around the uh, cyclone, the, the winds are going to be crossing those isobars from areas of higher pressure towards areas of lower pressure, that works out to being converging, to be meeting at the center of the cyclone. So winds go mostly around an area of low pressure in a counterclockwise way, but they kind of spiral in towards the middle. And then there's no place for the air to go once it gets to the middle except to rise. In contrast, an area of high pressure, which is often called an anticyclone, has winds that rotate around it in a clockwise manner at the surface, well actually at the surface or aloft, but at the surface the, since the winds are mostly following the isobars but a little bit crossing from higher pressure towards lower pressure, that means at the surface there is some divergence. The air is being pushed away from the center of the anticyclone, away from the center of the cyclone. There's air has to sink from above the anticyclone down into it at the surface to replace that air. The result is you get sinking motion in the center of the anticyclone. Look at that. Cyclones have convergence at the center of, it, of them. Now, we haven't yet learned about processes that cause clouds and storminess and so on, but cyclones have convergence and rising motion in the center. And let me tell you, anytime you have rising motion, you should be thinking clouds and precipitation. Cyclones, areas of low pressure, tend to have stormy weather. In contrast, anticyclones have divergence at the surface, and the air sinks from the middle atmosphere, from mid levels of the atmosphere down to the surface to replace them. Sinking motion, again, we haven't talked about how clouds happen and stuff like that yet, but sinking motion is always associated with fair weather, clear skies, etc. So high pressure systems or anticyclones are always associated with relatively fair weather. And that's why when you look at an aneroid barometer, like this kind of simple one that you, your grandparents might have had mounted on the wall or something like that, the, you can see how like on the inside hub of that ring we have pressure measured in millibars. You can see it goes from like 960 millibars up to 1000 millibars as you go around it on this aneroid barometer up to 1060 millibars. And see how it's labeled around the edge there? Stormy, rainy, fair, very dry. Because the higher the pressure gets, the more likely you're under an anticyclone which is going to be an area of sinking motion in fair weather. The lower the pressure gets, the more likely you're under a cyclone with rising motion and formation of clouds and precipitation. Now another important thing with regard to the production of power and so on that's uh, with regard uh, considering winds is how winds change with respect to height. Um, this is part of the reason why we have to do things launch, like launch weather balloons is we want to know what are the winds doing at various heights above the ground. 
Now, close to the ground, the winds are almost always weaker because of the influence of friction, which is slowing them down. A wind turbine is trying to harvest the kinetic energy from the wind and use it to power a generator or a dynamo or whatever. Well, down near the surface of the Earth where the wind speeds are low, there's not going to be a lot of kinetic energy. Don't get me wrong. Part of the story of kinetic energy is also the mass or the density of the material that's in motion. Well, the air near the surface is denser, is more dense. Um, so, yeah, it, that helps, but realistically the low wind speeds near the surface are a problem. A windmill near the surface, like a, one a farmer would have on their farm for pumping water or something, really doesn't have strong enough winds to produce large amounts of power. On the other hand, even a few tens of meters above the surface, where the effect of friction is much less, is going to have a much higher wind speed. And since the kinetic energy of the air is proportional to 1 half mv squared, where the mass of the air times the velocity squared, yeah, the air, you know, this wind, these wind turbines are what, about, I don't know, 70, 80 meters tall or something like that. Yes, the air is a little less dense here, so that would reduce the kinetic energy. But the velocity squared, I mean, the, the, the more, since we've increased the wind speed, well, we're increasing the amount of kinetic energy by the square of the wind. So it's a good idea for these wind turbines to be quite tall. Um, that's, of course, part of the idea behind these like high-altitude wind turbines that are not permanently moored, uh, not permanently on board a, like a tower uh, the way uh, like a wind turbine is a conventional one. These guys are actually attached using you know guy wires and so on. And then they are up at very high altitudes, maybe a few hundred or even a thousand kilom uh, kilometers, a thousand meters up, and much stronger winds can flow through them, and they can much more efficiently harvest um, kinetic energy and convert it to electricity if they can do it safely and so on. Obviously, those kinds of things are still very much experimental. So to think for a moment here about wind. Forecasting and modeling the wind is going to require a couple things. We're going to need to understand the forces that are at work. We're going to need to understand the profile of the wind. How are the wind going to be different at different altitudes above the ground? And we're going to need to know, in general, the distribution of the wind. How gusty is the wind? How much is this average wind speed reflecting the wind at any given moment? Uh, for that matter, how is the wind statistically represented? For example, uh, I'm going to build a new tower at this location. What kind of winds can I expect? What is an average wind? What is the range of wind speeds? What are the standard deviation of wind? That all sounds like something that we're going to need to do statistical modeling in order to understand. Okay, from here we're going to move on and start talking about moisture in the Earth's atmosphere, like humidity and rain and clouds and so on. So when you're ready, move on to the next lecture, and I'll see you there.